Good afternoon. Svatika, Kato Dijan Put Atai Amaidai Putai Dai Nitnoi Put Lao Mak, Dijan Si Stephanie Petsamai Stobi, Dijan Pin Ajan Yu Maha Vitiadai University of Winnipeg, Upate, Canada. Today's presentation will uh, be looking at my new book, uh, Conflict Resolution and Peace Building in Laos, Perspective for Today's World. Uh, this book was just released in uh, 2015, just this uh, July. And um, this is uh, part of the Rutledge Contemporary Southeast Asia series. And uh, the focus is on Laos, or Lao People's Democratic Republic, uh, your neighboring country. Just to give you some background on Laos, the population of Laos is 6.5 million, and it is considered a multi-ethnic society. There are 49 to 240 different ethnic groups living in the country, depending on the statistics that you look at. And each of these ethnic groups speak very distinct languages and have uh, different uh, cultures and uh, food. The Lao people have been categorized into three main categories the Lao Lum, uh, who constitute 68% of the population, the Lao Tung, 22%, and the Lao Su, 9%, depending on the elevation where they are living. The legal system in Laos is very underdeveloped. There are less than 100 practicing lawyers in a population of 6.5 million people. Therefore, they rely on traditional customs, French legal procedures, as they were part of French Indochina, and socialist practices since they have become a communist country in 1975. The legal system is inaccessible, expensive, and most of the people there do not have any knowledge of their legal rights. And the rule of law is applied inconsistently, depending on who you know. Therefore, um, they rely heavily on traditional conflict resolution processes. My interest in research in Laos uh, stems out of my cultural heritage. I was born in Laos, and I still have many family members living there. And uh, my professional work in the field of conflict resolution over the past 16 years. Um, I've noticed that Western practices have assumed superiority over other models of conflict resolution, neglecting traditional and indigenous processes of dispute resolution. I hope that this research will contribute to conflict resolution theory and practice by other cultural groups around the world. One of the research questions um, that I asked was how can culturally specific conflict resolution processes at the grassroots level be used to promote equality, justice, and freedom in places where formal legal systems are unfamiliar, undeveloped, and not a compelling force in promoting social justice. So I decided to do some in-depth interviews with the participants living in Laos. I interviewed 126 participants, 67 men and 59 women. 78% of, uh, of the participants are ethnic Lao, 22% come from various ethnic minorities, including the Kamu, Hmong, Taideng, Taidam, Katu, and O. The ages of the participants vary from age 20 to 89, and they come from diverse backgrounds. Some of them were university students. Others were elders in the community. We had NGOs, teachers, farmers, businessmen uh, who were being interviewed in this project. I uh, interviewed the participants in three different provinces in Laos, in Bogeo, Vieng Jan, and Luang Prabang. Uh, here's a, a photo of uh, one of my research um, assistants uh, who was instrumental in helping me collect data. This is Ajahn Suksaveng, and he is Kamu. And you can see the background uh, on the door, the uh, clothing that are hung on the doors. And that clothing is representative of the Kamu uh, culture. And so if they're wearing this clothing, you can tell that they are from the Kamu ethnic group. I also worked with uh, university students uh, in, uh, in Laos. Um, I felt that it was important to use uh, local uh, participants, uh, local assistants, because they understood the language and uh, they understood the culture and uh, all the interviews were done in Laos. 
And uh, here is another picture of uh, my other research assistant. Uh, we did research in uh, the cities as well as in some of the rural villages. And uh, this is one of the smaller villages up in the mountains where we conducted some of the interviews. And uh, here's another photo of another village uh, in, uh, in Laos where we went and uh, had discussions and conversations with the people in that uh, community. And what I found from uh, our conversations and discussions and interviews with the various participants is that the Lao people do have conflict resolution structures. And uh, so two of the structures that really stood out from this research is that they have an elaborate mediation system. And so from discussing and talking with them about their mediation systems, I was able to put uh, their uh, conflict resolution processes into allow conflict resolution spectrum and discuss the different forms of mediation that they have in their community. The second uh, conflict resolution structure is the uh, rituals that they have in their community. And these are culturally specific conflict resolution and reconciliation rituals called the Sukwan and Suma. And uh, for many people in Laos, uh, one of the first responses to conflict is to avoid conflict. And uh, so this, uh, this uh, method is very, very common, this avoidance of conflict. They have a Lao expression or a Lao proverb that says, don't pull your pants and let others see your bum. And uh, so this is reflective of uh, their understanding and their perspective on conflict. Uh, they believe that conflict leads to aina, which means embarrassment to the face, and siena sieta, uh, meaning a loss of face and eyes. And therefore, they would try to avoid conflict as much as possible. But if that isn't possible, then they will go into uh, looking at different processes to deal with their conflicts. And uh, so I was able to put these different processes into a Lao conflict resolution spectrum. And so the very first uh, process is uh, the discussion or problem solving. They often use the term oplum. So when you're in this process, um, the people are, uh, are discussing and oplum uh, regarding the conflict situation and uh, looking at ways to address those uh, issues. And if they can't resolve that um, on their own, that's when they go to mediation. And so the next five levels are mediation processes. And so the first kind of mediation that they use is the parents' mediation, the palme. And uh, if they have a conflict, one of the first options they have is to go to their parents to see if their parents can act as a mediator to help them resolve their dispute. And if they are not able to resolve their, their dispute at that level, they will move to the relatives mediation where they, where they will invite um, their um, aunts and uncles, uh, Pa, Lung, Pinong, and relatives to uh, assist them in resolving that conflict. And uh, the aunt or uncle will then play the role of a mediator. And if that still doesn't work and they still cannot resolve conflict at that level, they will move up to the elders mediation where they will call upon the elders in their village or in their community who are well respected and they will ask them to mediate uh, the conflict. And uh, usually they're able to resolve the conflicts at uh, that level, but if they still cannot resolve that conflict, they will move to the village leader mediation. And this is the Naiban. And uh, the village leader will then uh, work with the parties in conflict and help them move towards a resolution. And uh, finally, the last level of mediation is the village mediation committee, or the Noi Gai Kie. This is a committee, um, and I will talk a little bit about it uh, in, a, in a few minutes, that will sit with the parties and their families and uh, the other mediators, and they will discuss the conflict and, again, how they can move forward to a resolution of conflict. And very rarely do conflicts move past this level. So the majority of the conflicts, if it does reach the level of the village mediation committee, will be resolved at this level. And uh, in all of my interviews, only one conflict case went through the court system. And as you can see in uh, level seven, eight, nine, and 10, you can move from the village court, the San Ban, the district court, the San Meung, provincial court, San Quang, and supreme court, San Sung. 
And uh, one case went through this, and it was a case uh, about a business conflict, a family business. And so two siblings decided to uh, create uh, this business together. And one of the siblings had borrowed money from the other sibling, but the business did not turn out very well, and uh, it fell apart. And now uh, one of the siblings is wanting to, uh, uh, to have the uh, money that was loaned to the other sibling paid back, but this wasn't happening. And they went through all the different levels of mediation, and they weren't able to resolve it. And that's why they ended up in the court system. And at the court system, uh, they, um, they uh, got into uh, more conflict. And uh, there was a tremendous uh, loss of face to them and to the family members. And to this day, they still do not talk with one another. And so you can see uh, the importance of mediation, which is much more private, to try and resolve your dispute. And uh, when I refer to uh, village, I'm also uh, referring to not only small rural uh, communities, but also a neighborhood or a subdivision in a city. So many times uh, in Laos, a city will be divided into different villages. Uh, looking at the five levels of mediation, um, you will see that there is a progression of levels of mediation. So if you move from the parents to the relatives to the elders, village leaders, and finally the Noi Gaikia, you can see this progression. And uh, when you are dealing with uh, mediation at the parents' level, where they play the role of a mediator, the process tends to be much more informal. It is private. There is no fee associated with that process. And uh, the reparation or restitution tends to be much smaller. And there are few participants that are involved in the mediation process. And of course, the psychological or emotional costs are a lot lower. And as you move up uh, the uh, levels of mediation and reach the Noi Gaikia level, the process becomes much more formal and it becomes much more public. And there is a fee associated with this level. And the reparation tends to be larger, or restitution. And there are many more participants, because the parents, relatives, elders, village leaders from the previous mediation levels are also invited to participate and attend the Noi Gaikia mediation process. And so there are many more participants involved. And of course, the high uh, psychological costs associated with uh, going through uh, the higher levels of uh, mediation. So just to uh, give you an idea about the Noi Gaikia, which is a village or a community mediation committee, it uh, consists of seven individuals that represent different groups living in the community. So you have the village leader, or the Naiban, who plays the role of the facilitator of the mediation process. You have an elder, uh, the Taukea Neohom. You have an informal mediator, the Gaikia. You have a women's union representative, the Samakom Puying. You have a young people's representative, the Sao Num. You have a police representative, the Bong Gan, or a Bokasaw. And you have a military representative, the Bong Lun. And these individuals will work together to try and help the parties resolve their dispute. So when you look at some of the conflicts that are addressed by the Noi Gaikia, uh, you will see that um, they deal with all kinds of conflicts in the community. They deal with workplace conflicts, they deal with family conflicts, they deal with community conflicts. So some examples of uh, family conflicts include abuse or violence in the family, separation, divorce, theft or gambling, children who are involved in drugs or, uh, or hanging out with friends that their parents don't approve, inheritance issues, are, uh, are big family conflicts that the Noi Gaikia have had to deal with. In terms of workplace conflicts, uh, they are dealing with sometimes lazy employees, accidental deaths, project loans, uh, lack of money for hiring laborers, or lack of money to purchase seeds for planting. And in terms of community conflicts, uh, they have had to deal with land disputes, uh, floods, uh, water shortages, relocation. So if uh, the government uh, decides that they would like to build a school in this location, and it happens to be where you're living, then they will relocate you and, uh, and uh, build a school there. Or uh, 
dam companies, you know, that are wanting to work on hydroelectric dams. And so uh, many uh, uh, communities are then moved from, uh, from their homes and relocated. And so that has created a number of conflicts in the community. Uh, children from different families are fighting with one another or just general neighbor disputes. And so uh, they will go to the Noi Gaikia to try and help them resolve these kinds of conflicts. Looking at the Noi Gaikia process, um, usually what happens uh, when the Noi Gaikia is called upon to address these uh, conflicts, they will have individual meetings with each party to gather as much information as they can about the conflict. And after that, they will invite the individual along with their support networks uh, for a meeting to discuss the conflict uh, so that they can hear about the conflict from all the different perspectives and views. And once they have had a chance to do that, they will call for a joint mediation meeting with all the parties and support networks to discuss the conflict and its resolution. And once uh, they have been able to do that within their joint meeting, uh, the Noikaikia will have a private meeting to consider all information and come to a consensus regarding what needs to be done in the situation. And finally, they will call a joint meeting where the Noikaikia will come and share the decision with the whole group. So as you can see uh, from my uh, presentation on uh, the different mediation processes, you can see that there are uh, some characteristics of Lao conflict resolution processes that are quite unique. So one of the characteristics is the progression of dispute resolution processes. And uh, there is cultural norms and expectations that require the parties to go to their families first for assistance. And so you can see that in the different levels of mediation, going from parents to relatives to elders to village leaders and finally the Noikaikia. A second characteristic is the inclusion of other mediators in subsequent processes. And uh, this is really uh, unique uh, because in our mediation processes in the West, we would never invite previous mediators from previous sessions to come to the next mediation session. And uh, here they include these other mediators and it does provide a natural support network for the parties in conflict. It also ensures consistency, transparency and accountability on part of the parties and on part of the mediators that they have really tried their best to resolve the conflicts at the previous levels of mediation. And a third characteristic is the opportunities for resolution. The people in Laos are given many opportunities to resolve their dispute. At each different level of mediation, they are given three chances to modify and to implement the agreement. And so they have an opportunity to go back to their parents three times for mediation, to modify and implement the agreement. And if they still are not able to do that, then they will go to the next level of mediation and they'll have three chances there. Uh, and they will continue doing that until they reach the Noikaikia level. And at that level, after three chances, and uh, if they're not able to resolve their uh, problem and their conflict at that level, the Noikaikia will forward the case to the court system. And the fourth characteristic is that there are fees associated with an escalation of conflict. As I said earlier, fees begin with the Noikaikia level, about 50,000 GIP, which is about $5 uh, US. Um, and uh, when, uh, when you look at this, it doesn't seem like a lot of money. But for the people over there, that's about a week's wage. And so there is this incremental increase in fee for upper level conflict resolution services. Therefore, there is a strong incentive to resolve conflicts at the lower levels. And another uh, conflict resolution structure that um, I want to explore a little bit in this presentation is the rituals of conflict resolution and uh, reconciliation. And uh, when we look at uh, conflict resolution processes in the West, and uh, when a conflict has ended or a mediation has ended, we often just shake um, hands with one another and we go our separate ways. But uh, in Laos, uh, there are specific rituals that are used at the end of a conflict situation. 
So when you look at conflict resolution rituals in Laos, Stuart Fox and Mixay say that Laos is a land of festivals. Every village, every temple, and every ethnic minority not only holds its own special festivals, but also joins the wider Lao community in celebrating the national ones as well. And so the uh, festivals, getting together, um, sharing of food, uh, celebrating are very, very important rituals. So for example, uh, in Laos, we celebrate the Western New Year on January 1st. We celebrate the Lao and Thai New Year, which occurs in April. We celebrate the Hmong New Year and the Kamu New Year, and everyone participates in that festival. And so the two main conflict resolution rituals and celebrations are the Suquan and the Suma. Uh, here is a photo of uh, a Buddhist temple uh, in Laos. Uh, and uh, these rituals are a blend of Buddhism and animism. And uh, here's another uh, photo of the spirit cults, uh, which have been incorporated into the official Theravada Buddhist religion. And uh, the Sukhwan is a blend of Buddhism and animism that is so prevalent in these cultures. And again, it's really difficult to separate what is religion and what is culture when you look at some of these rituals that they have in Laos, because they are so intertwined. And so here's a picture of the seven-headed Naga. And uh, so according to uh, the Lao and Thai, uh, these are the wise serpents or dragons. Um, they dwell in the lakes and streams and they guard treasures. Uh, these snake uh, they're snake-like uh, with magic powers to turn uh, or transform to humans. And according to the Thai and Lao folklore, they live in the Mekong River. And uh, according to the Lao, they believe that the Nagas are protectors of Vientiane and the Lao state. And so when you look at the Sukhwan as a conflict resolution ritual, um, the Sukhwan is one of the most important social practices shared by all ethnic groups living in Laos. Um, although the uh, processes and the rituals may look a little differently, but they have something very similar across the different ethnic groups. They're conducted for various occasions. Uh, to welcome visitors uh, when someone is sick, um, at weddings, funerals, and what I was particularly interested in um, that no one has written about is to celebrate the end of conflict as part of reparation and restitution for the wrong that has been done. And so when you look at the Sukhwan ritual, um, the Buddhist uh, tradition, when you look at Sukhwan, um, the Buddhists believe it is part of merit making. It defines bun kun, respect, gratitude, and merit. And it is also part of gift giving. And the animus tradition, the tying of sacred threads, symbolizes reuniting of the 32 components of an individual spirit essence, the Samsip Song Kwan, into the body. And so they believe that the absence of Kwan weakens a person's spiritual force, leading to illness, indecisiveness, and depression. And so a Su Kwan restores the spiritual force, according to Stuart Fox and Mixay. Sukhwan restores relationships and harmony between people, groups, and communities. And so uh, the next slide, when you look at this picture, uh, it is a picture of a pakwan. And for every Sukhwan, there is a pakwan, which is a small table. And at the center of this table is usually a floral arrangement. And uh, it's usually made uh, with uh, banana leaves and flowers. And, uh, and within uh, this floral arrangement, they will also place sacred threads that will be used during the ceremony in there. And this floral centerpiece is placed at the center of the small table. And around the table, they will place food. So they will place fruit and rice and egg and cookies and uh, other desserts, which will be given out uh, during the ceremony. And as you can see, um, the, the next slide, uh, once the blessings are completed, each person present takes two pieces of thread from the floral arrangement and ties one on the wrist of the honored guests. While the threads are being tied uh, around the wrist of the uh, honored guests, the person who is having his or her wrist tied um, holds up the other hand in a prayer-like gesture. And the person who is tying the thread gives some blessings and well wishes. For example, oh sister, I wish you health and happiness. May you bring your family joy and make them proud. May you succeed in life. May you have many wonderful children. 
While this is taking place, others around uh, may hold onto the arm or the elbow of uh, the person being blessed, um, and, or they can hold onto uh, the table as well. And it is customary to take a bite of the food that has been given you to show respect and acceptance of their well wishes. And so here's another uh, slide of uh, the sacred threads that are being tied around the wrists of uh, the honored guests as well as all the other participants at, uh, at the Su Kwan. And of course, at the end of the Su Kwan ceremony, there is always an elaborate meal that is served. And everyone is invited to partake at the meal and to visit with one another. Um, it is a way of coming together, a way of rebuilding or restoring the relationships between the parties in conflict and their families and communities. And again, the honored guests are served first, but there's a lot of food for everyone else. And um, they are very inclusive. So if you see someone walking down the street that hadn't been invited, you will invite them to join in the fest uh, festivity. And so the atmosphere is one of celebration where families, friends, and community can come together to celebrate an important event and uh, to celebrate the end of a uh, conflict. So the celebration can last well into the evening. And uh, so this is very, very important um, to have a meal at the end and to share this meal together. So a Sukhwan is a conflict resolution ritual. Uh, so the larger the conflicts, um, often those involving physical injuries or other forms of violence often require a Sukhwan in order to repair the harm that has been done. And the size of the Su Kwan reflects the gravity of the conflict. So the bigger the conflict, the bigger the celebration, the bigger the Su Kwan. And uh, it's a way to repair the damage with the support of your family and community. So the family and community, um, the party that was in the wrong, is responsible for preparing the celebration. And in restoring the Kwan, the ceremony also restores the face and status of the parties in conflict, their families, and their communities. It is part of forgiveness, reparation, and restoration. And uh, this ritual is done according to the injured party's cultural traditions. So if I am ethnic Lao and you are Kamu, and I have injured you in some way and wronged you in some way, then I and my family will prepare the Sukhwan according to the Kamu's tradition and your needs and your interests and your traditions. And this is how they are able to rebuild the relationship and repair the harm that has been done. And so the next uh, ritual is the Suma. This is a reconciliation ceremony. It is similar to the Sukhwan. It has a mix of Buddhist and animist traditions. And uh, if you compare it to the Sukhwan, the Sukhwan can be uh, looked at in terms of being a full-scale symphony. It's elaborate, it's complex, there are many parties involved. And then the Suma is more like a string quartet. Um, there is closeness and intimacy, and uh, the number of people are much smaller. So one of my participants uh, stated uh, when we were talking about a Suma, she said that if we embarrass our parents in some way, we must do a Suma in order to repair the face and eyes of the elders. We must also prepare food so that we can all eat together. So this is, uh, again, something very, very important. And so if you look at the next slide, the Suma ceremony, uh, you can see uh, that uh, it is, uh, it, uh, while the Sukhwan is a celebration uh, that is open to families, friends, and the rest of the community, the Suma represents a reconciliation process only within families or extended families. So in this photo, you will see uh, that there are two grandchildren conducting a Suma to pay respect to their grandparents. They are asking for forgiveness because apparently they had eloped without inviting their grandparents to the wedding. And uh, so uh, they um, have created some tensions with their grandparents. And so they are presenting their grandparents with articles of clothing and a small flower arrangement with money tucked within the bouquets as a symbol of their love and respect for their grandparents. Their heads are bowed to show their respect to those who are older than themselves. And so the next slide shows that the children have apologized and asked for forgiveness, and the elders have forgiven them. 
as the parents, grandparents, and elders are tying the wrists of the younger generation with sacred threads, they in turn give blessings to the children, wishing them good health, happiness, and success um, after they have accepted their apology and offered their forgiveness. And so the rituals of conflict resolution um, is really, really important in these communities. And again, these rituals would be very similar in Thailand. Every culture has its own rituals and ceremonies that are important for relationship building. Why are rituals important in conflict resolution and peace building? And so from uh, my discussions and conversations with the participants in Laos, um, they uh, value conflict resolution rituals because first of all, it brings closure and end to the conflict. And so this conflict has happened and now uh, we have this Sukhwan and uh, we can uh, end uh, this conflict, it brings closure. It also acknowledges the wrong that has been done and, uh, and so there is acknowledgement on part of the parties uh, responsible for the conflict, and, uh, and there is this uh, acknowledgement. It restores face, uh, it shows respect for the culture. As I mentioned earlier, you do it according to the wronged person's culture. It symbolically demonstrates the end of conflict. So visually, you can see this ceremony, you're participating in it. There are people all around you that is witness to, uh, to, uh, to this uh, event. It provides support networks or a sense of community. As I said earlier, these rituals involve families, it involves community members, and so you have a natural support network as you move forward. It encourages reconciliation and movement forward, and it is future focused. And so they're no longer looking at the past and what has happened, but looking at the future and how they can rebuild their relationships. So it definitely represents a new beginning for many of the people that are involved in these conflict resolution rituals. And uh, so from this research in Laos, um, I was able to identify the tenets of conflict resolution. These are the basic principles underlying conflict resolution processes that emerge from the discussion with the various participants in, uh, in Laos. So what are some of the characteristics of conflict resolution processes or systems that are important for effective conflict resolution of any kind? And uh, so I was able to, uh, to uh, uh, identify these tenets of conflict resolution, and I used the acronym RESOLUTION to identify what these tenets are. So the R stands for relationship building. So if you look at any conflict resolution processes, if you want to have satisfying and, and, uh, and uh, resolutions that are sustainable and long-lasting, you have to rebuild relationships. You have to uh, encourage um, them to come together and, uh, and to be able to work and live together. So relationship building is very important. E is for explainability or accountability. So people who are in conflict need to take responsibility for what uh, they have done and for their part in the conflict and to be held accountable for, uh, for that and to be able to explain why they did the things that they did. And so um, E is explainability or accountability. S is settlement or reparation. Um, so it is important to not only apologize, but also to repair the harm that has been done. What else can you do to repair the harm? What kinds of restitution can you give the other party in order to make things better? And so it can be uh, uh, money, but it can also be other kinds of services to the family or communities, um, other gestures that will show them that you are trying to repair the harm that has been done. O is for opportunity and accessibility. So everyone in Laos has an opportunity to resolve their disputes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they have three, you know, three chances to try and resolve their conflicts at each mediation level. And uh, each of them in their communities have access to these mediation processes and to these mediators in their community, uh, whether it's parents, um, uh, relatives, elders, village leaders, or the Noi Gaigia. L is for liveness or flexibility. You will see that uh, in the Lao conflict resolution uh, processes, they are very flexible in terms of who can be present at the mediation, in terms of where the mediation can take place. Um, you know, sometimes it can take place at the village leader's home, 
Other times it can take place at your home. Other times it could be in the rice field or in the community center. And so they're very flexible in terms of, uh, of how they can resolve their disputes. U is for understanding or familiarity. Everyone in Laos has a clear understanding of what they need to do to resolve their disputes. They are familiar with the processes. They're familiar with the mediators. These mediators are known to them. They're known to the communities. They're well respected. Whereas in the West, if I'm a mediator and I, and I know one of the parties in conflict, I can't mediate because that could be a conflict of interest. But over there, um, they're very familiar with their mediators and they want someone that is known to them. T is for transparency. Again, uh, looking at uh, open and honest discussions uh, of the conflict and um, having uh, subsequent mediators uh, uh, attend uh, the next level of mediation show some transparency in uh, these different mediation processes. I is inclusivity. Again, um, everyone who has been affected by the conflict are invited to come to, uh, to the mediation and to also be a part of the conflict resolution rituals. And uh, so they are very inclusive in terms of uh, the participants. O is originality or creativity. So the resolution of the conflict can be as creative and as original as you would like it to be. And uh, when you're looking at the Su Quan Tzu, you're doing it according to, uh, to the traditions of the wronged person. And so you can be creative in how uh, that uh, can look like and uh, what needs to take place. And so they are very open to originality and creativity in uh, the resolution of conflict. And N is for networks or support networks. So when you are in a conflict situation and you're doing a mediation, uh, if you can have these support networks around you, that's going to help you move forward and help you towards a resolution. And once the resolution has been, uh, has been agreed upon, then these support networks can also help you as you uh, work on the terms of the agreement and uh, in the future to support you uh, as uh, you are working out uh, the different details of that agreement. And so support networks are really, really important. And uh, so those are the tenets of conflict resolution that emerged from uh, this particular research. And I want to, um, uh, you know, uh, end with the, the Lao folk tale called Wrapped Ash Delight. So the tenets of conflict resolution can be found in the following story written by Buya Vong and told to me by different people in Laos. And uh, it is a story or a folk tale of two young girls, Nang Piu and Nang Oi. Nang Oi was bathing in the river and forgot her silver belt on the bank of the river. Nang Piu finds it and keeps it. Later, Nang Oi asked if she had seen the belt, and Nang Piu said no. At home, Nang Piu looks in the mirror and sees an unhappy face, full of worries, suspicions. It seemed many eyes followed her. Her heart was heavy. She was not very happy. Nang Oi was also unhappy and reported the loss of the belt to the village leader. To address this conflict, the Naiban or Kwan Ban and elders in the community asked everyone who had been at the river to come for a meeting at his house. They explained that they suspected someone had taken the belt and asked the person to admit to the crime and return it. Nang Piu was too scared to admit to the crime. So the Naiban or Kwan Ban came up with another strategy. He told everyone in the village to wrap ashes and chili in a package of banana leaves placed inside a basket and bring his or her basket to his house. At the house, they left their baskets in an empty room and came out to wait with the crowd. The ashes and chili, kitao la makpit, or priktai, are symbols of fiery pain for those who steal. An elder began to open one package at a time. After 16, 17, and 18 packages, the belt still had not appeared. He became discouraged but continue opening the packages. When he opened the 19th package, a big pile of ash came tumbling down to reveal a shiny object. All the people screamed with happiness, including the person who returned the belt, whom no one could name. The noisy commotion symbolized the love, solidarity, sincerity, and brotherhood that had been shared by all in this village from many generations. This folktale demonstrates the characteristics of the tenets of conflict resolution.
including opportunity or accessibility, liveness or flexibility, originality or creativity, inclusivity, re relationship building, and support networks. They were able to resolve this conflict in a way that satisfied everyone and in a way that was able to help save face of all the parties involved in the conflict. And um, also, they uh, allowed for anonymity in terms of resolving this uh, conflict. So you can see uh, that uh, the Lao conflict resolution uh, systems are uh, very prevalent uh, in those communities. And, uh, and I want to conclude uh, with uh, just uh, you know, a few points, that uh, the rituals exemplify symbolic acts taking place in unique places that are forming and transforming people's worldviews, identities, and relationships. Um, so this is according to Shirk. And uh, mediation and conflict resolution ritual structures are owned and operated by people directly affected by the conflict. They are defined by the community in which they are performed. They are grassroots structures that operate independently of hierarchical government, political, or business structures. And I hope that as the country uh, begins to develop a formal legal system, that they will not forget about these rich uh, mediation processes and rich conflict resolution rituals that they have in their countries, and that they will be able to incorporate uh, these different models and, uh, and uh, provide an option for the people in, uh, in their communities. And so uh, this presentation is uh, based on my book, Conflict Resolution and Peace Building in Laos. And so if you would like further information and more detailed uh, information, you can find that in, uh, in my book. So thank you very much. Kop kun mak and diopopkan mai.